talk a little bit about the ecclesia. Um, it's so funny because sometimes I, I talk at different things and we have prayer meetings or different meetings going on and sometimes I talk about some of these things and I think, did I ever talk about that on a Sunday morning? And I think, I don't think I did. So, um, I had. Well, maybe not, because I'm blending in from home and like, yeah. yeah. So, I was asking Holy Spirit, you know, kind of this year, like, you know, over the, until the last Sunday of um, last year, we have focused on John, on the book of John, and then, a, you know, a few things here and there, we've had guest speakers, and then sometimes we've had something on our, on our heart to share, so we, you know, veered off of John for, for a week or so. But uh, we finally finished the book of John uh, at the end of the last year, and I said, you know, I want to go and do some more uh, what we call topical messages um, and focus on some of the things I really want us to be building as, as, uh, as living springs. I want, I want us to, to uh, begin to understand really who we are as a, as a church, what our purpose is, some of the foundational things that make Living Springs um, who we are. And um, uh, so uh, there were so many things on my mind, so it's hard for me to, to settle on something, but here we are. Here we, we're going to be on Ecclesia, so, um, or, and some other things. But if you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it's probably a pretty common scripture uh, for most of us. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, and, I, and I'm in the New Living Translation, but I'm also going to read out of the message a little bit. And it says, uh, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, both, people, both, both prophets who had, who had died, you know, John the Baptist much more recently, of course. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So people were thinking, okay, he's a prophet. And still today people say, oh, he was a good prophet. You know. So he says, um, uh, then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, which is, means the anointed one, the son of the living God. And it's really interesting that in the Gospels, except for the Gospel of John that we just went through, Jesus doesn't really call himself the Son of God. He refers to himself as the Son of Man, which is an important title, but he refers to himself as the Son of Man. And, and he doesn't like flaunt the idea that he's the Son of God. In a sense. Maybe, maybe flaunt isn't the right word, but often, even in this case, or in, in, this, in this passage here, which I didn't, I, I didn't even read, uh, I won't even get to that part, but he tells them, don't tell anybody. <laughs> you know, if you heard Jesus say that sometimes, like, oh, don't tell anybody. Have you, have you heard that? You know, oh, you got healed. Well, don't tell anybody who did it. You know, or in this case, you know, you're the Messiah. Well, don't tell anybody. It's interesting how, how he did that, but he did want to make sure that his followers knew who he was. And so Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John. Because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. So he was saying that Peter had gotten a revelation from God. Um, you know, some, sometimes you can hear a teaching or you can read the scripture, and it just sort of falls flat. Yep. Does that ever happen to anybody beside me? It sort of falls flat. doesn't mean it wasn't great. doesn't mean it wasn't a good thing. But it just doesn't, I don't know, we use the word resonate with us. You know, it doesn't, it didn't, it, we we thought, oh, that sounds nice, but it didn't, it didn't come as a revelation. And then there's time, there are times when something somebody says, or when you're in your own prayer time, or when you're studying the scripture, you get what we call revelation. And it like is like, whoa, that was really good. That's like, it's life changing. It will alter your life in some way. That's what happened with Peter. He got revelation that Jesus was the Son of God. He goes, nobody told nobody else told you that you didn't learn this talking with with the other disciples or with anybody else. The Father has revealed that to you. You've got revelation from the Father. This was really important because revelation from the Father is what we want. That's what we need. There's lots of information out there. But revelation from the Father is what we, what we need so that we can live by the truth, right? So um, 
He says, the Father's revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being. Now I say this, that you are Peter. Now he was, he was Simon before, right? Then he said, let's see, Simon Peter asked. Yep. So Simon, he says to Simon, you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, and he actually, there's actually two different words for rock used there in the, in the original language. Uh, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I don't believe that Jesus was telling Peter that Peter was the rock himself that he was going to build the church on. Some, some in the church believe that. I don't believe that. I believe it was the rock of the revelation that he was the Son of God. The rock, the foundation of the revelation. We know Jesus is the, is the foundation of the church, right? Peter, or Paul tells us that later on. You know, there's no, only one foundation that can be laid, and that, that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. The foundation that, that the church that Jesus was going to build the church on was that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, not that Peter was a, uh, was a smart guy. <laughs> they got revelation. It was the revelation that, that the church was going to be built on. Right? So he says, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The gates of hell will not stand against it. And I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Different way than if you've read the, the New International Version, if you've read the King James Version, you've heard it said different ways, right? Um, but this is, this is a powerful scripture. This is a powerful time that Jesus is having with his disciples. And it's, it's, it is foundational, to, to use the word that Jesus used. It's a foundational scripture for the church. What, um, what is interesting is that the word that is uh, translated into church there is the Greek word ecclesia. Now, if you know any Spanish, what's the Spanish word for church? Iglesia. Iglesia. Very similar to ecclesia. What's the English word for ecclesia? Church. Church. It's actually not a good word. Actually, the word that should be translated church from the Greek is, and I wrote it down here, kairios. It means belonging to the Lord. That's the word that actually should translate into the English, the word church. Ecclesia, and I'm only saying this, not because it's just all bad, and we'll use the word church, I'm not saying we won't use the word church, I'm just saying that because of the connotation and because of what church has become to me, to me, it's a place we go, you know. Really, it, it's impossible to go to church. In, in, the, in the reality of what the church is, the church is something that Jesus was saying that he was going to build. I'm going to read this. Oh, and I'm trying to bring in a few of the things that were said last week. Uh, one of the things was, um, I, I think Luke brought it out. He said the church uh, isn't a place that you can go. It's a place that should be your home. And then I think Danielle pointed out that three times, I think it was one of the things you said and somebody else said, that it was uh, that church was supposed to be a home for us. Luke said it was, uh, it's, it's supposed to be your second home. Remember that? When he, when he said that, you know, when we were listening, what, what's the Holy Spirit saying about Living Springs for 2016? Church isn't a place you're supposed to go. It's supposed to be your second home, right? Which is interesting, when Jesus said he's going to build a church, what, what's, what's a home? It's not, a home isn't a house, right? It's another, another one of those words, right? A home isn't a house. It's a place where your family gathers, right? It's a place where your family is, right? So, so when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, or more, more properly, I'm going to build my ecclesia, first of all, he was saying it was his ecclesia. You know, a lot of times we go, oh, that's my church. It's not really. It's all Jesus' church, the whole deal. <laughs> it all belongs to him. And when we keep those, see, when we allow those subtle little changes to affect what we think about what the ecclesia is, that it could be mine or it could be a place I could go, it changes the value of what it actually is without realizing it. It's not what we're trying. We're not trying to say it's something different. But when Jesus, this is a powerful thing that Jesus is saying here. And if we understand what he's saying, then we can understand when the church begins to look like what he was talking about. 
Okay, let me read this here um, in the message because I really like the way it said it. I, I actually don't read the message a whole lot because sometimes it's a little silly to me almost. Yeah, like some of the way that it says things, you know, but I thought this was pretty great. It says in Matthew 16, the same, same verses. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of the books from t uh, or out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God Himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Now think about that. So expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Wow. Now, when we sing, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, a lot of times we think about the gates of hell trying to come against the church. But that's not the case. The case is that the light is to infiltrate the darkness. That the church is to come against the gates of hell. Right. Not the gates of hell trying to come against the church. It's, there's subtle differences, but they're so important for us to get that we are to begin be advancing. Just like in the Garden of Eden, when when uh, the Father said to Adam and Eve, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, and why don't you take dominion and rule over this creation? Right? It was to advance. More powerful, yeah. But they messed that up. But then Jesus restored it. So we don't even have to focus on that they messed it up. Right. Jesus restored everything to us when he came on the cross. He turned everything the opposite of what it had become. <laughs> <laughs> right? Everything was switched around. The whole world changed by, by the, Jesus' death on the cross. And now we have become empowered to be, to be called out of darkness into an ecclesia and become an ecclesia, which is a, an assembly. Now, let's, let's talk about the ecclesia a little bit more. I don't think I'm going to get to the keys of the kingdom this week, so we'll see. So ecclesia literally means called out. It was a word that you, they used. Call that one. Yeah, call that one. But it wasn't used just for religious meetings. It was uh, literally, when he used the word ecclesia to the people, that they understood what he was talking about because it was a common word in the culture. It was, in fact, and you can look it up, and I'll, I'll read it here. Um, a properly, it was a gathering of citizens called out of their homes into some public place. It was an assembly. And they were, they were called out to do political business, to make decisions, to, to, to judge certain matters in, in the city. So every city would have had an ecclesia. Every community would have had an ecclesia. And it was made up of all people from all different uh, parts of the culture that would come together and make policy for that city. So the term was familiar. But Jesus said, I'm going to build my ecclesia. I'm going to bring together an assembly out of, you know, we know, we know later, we'll look at some of these scriptures, out of darkness, out of the kingdom of darkness, and I'm going to bring this ecclesia together to make policy for the earth. Wow. That's cool. That's yeah. Right? That's what the church is supposed to do. Wow. We're not supposed to just come together and sing songs and hear a nice right. message yeah. and then go home right. and wait till next week and try to live a good life. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. We are called, and we're, so we're always the church. Whether we're together here or not, we're always the church. We're always, and, and that's why... Fellowship and community is such an important part of the church, and that's, I believe, why the enemy has worked so hard against fellowship and community in the church, because we are much less effective when we're not in relationship with him. So he says, um, he says, I'm going to call out my church, and I'm going to, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, or, as it said in the message, this uh, this is going to be ecclesia that's so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Mm. And how often do you hear people that are part of this amazing assembly of people afraid of what the darkness is doing? Mm. Mm. We don't have to be afraid of what the darkness is doing. Mm. We are so much more powerful. Mm. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Mm. Light always overcomes darkness. That's why I use those terms, because 
they, they give us a picture of the reality of the situation in the supernatural or in the spiritual realm or in the realm of the kingdom. They give us a picture of that. If you come into a, a place that's dark, our fir the first thing you want to do is flip on a light. And the darkness doesn't go, oh, no, no, no. Light's not going to affect me. It has no choice. It, it disappears. And it doesn't even have to be big light. You know, you can come in with a little candle or one of those little pen light, and, and eventually your eyes will adjust. Now, sometimes it's not, it's not the amount of light so much. It's our awareness of the light, right? It takes a little while for our eyes to adjust to the reality of the difference that the light is making. Right? Sometimes we're just not as aware as we need to be as people to the difference that the light is making. We need to become more aware. Yeah. So, so, and it's, and it's in, I, I believe it's the understanding of what the scripture is actually saying that helps us to become more aware of these things. It's getting, putting away the idea that we can go to church and that's just the place you do, do on a Sunday or even, or, or, or that we're, or that the gates of hell are trying to, pre, you know, prevail against us. No, no, no. We are, we are a called out assembly. Powerful, powerful. Anointed people, the Messiah, right? Um, we're anointed like the Messiah. That means anointed one. We're anointed for a purpose in this earth. For the time that God has put us here, called together to join together and do something to advance against the gates of hell. And they cannot prevail. Mm -hmm. They can't stand against the ecclesia. Mm -hmm. But that also means we've got to do something. that We don't just... We're not just hiding out or, you know, you know we, we do something. So, things like, we're going to the methadone clinic. That's a, that's a gate of hell for some yeah, people. Like, yeah. The gates of hell do not prevail against the church. So when the light comes into a place like that, yeah. it's light, it's love. It's not, we're not militant. Mm -hmm. We're not going to there and tell them how awful they are for being addicted to heroin or whatever they're addicted to that makes them have to go to the methadone clinic. We're not going there to tell them how wrong they are. We're going to tell them how God loves them and wants to pull them out of darkness into light. We might even not even get to that. We might just pour out love. And they feel loved that day. You know. But but the gates of hell can't stand it. Love is more powerful, right? We even sing a song, more powerful than death, right? More, love is more powerful than any force. I mean, that's what compelled Jesus to come and change everything. It was love. So if we're motivated by love, the gates of hell cannot stand against love. There's nothing that can stand against love. Just like darkness can't stand against light, nothing can stand against love, the love of God. So, we're called out into this, this ecclesia to become this ecclesia. That's his ecclesia. It's not mine. It's not any, it's not Billy Graham's, it's not any, any pastor's, not, it's not Joe Olstein's ecclesia, it's nobody's ecclesia but Jesus. That's another thing we have to keep in mind. There is one church in Hamilton. There's one, in a sense, there's one universal church in a sense, right? Okay, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord that's saved, has, you know, when they, when they said, um, when they started preaching in Jerusalem after, on the day of Pentecost, it says, it said after that, that people were adding to the church, adding to the ecclesia. They were adding to the ecclesia daily, those who were being saved. Now, they may not have all met in the same building, but they were still added to. Can you imagine? Where would 3,000 people, where would they find a place to meet all, just yeah. out of the blue? 3,000 people, men, plus men and children. A few days later, another 5,000 plus women and children. They weren't, they weren't even favored there. So it's not like they could have just called up, uh, you know, Herod or whoever's in charge. Of the at the time. Hey, you know, hey, we, got, we, need, we need a place for about 10,000 people to meet. You got, got some place we can meet. We really feel like it free because they don't even know about tithing yet. Or, <laughs> you know, where were they going to meet? They weren't meeting in one building, more than likely. They weren't meeting in the temple. The temple wasn't, what you know. So they were meeting house to house, just like the scripture says. Come, but, but they were all one. right? So well, as we look at the church even today, as divided as it is, we have to still see the church of Hamilton as one church and people just meeting in different buildings. And the thing is, every church is unique. Every person is unique in this building. And every church is unique in the, in the larger structure of the church. And so we all 
have a, a, as as individuals, we have a purpose here. That's why I love like a, a meeting like last week. I think just almost everybody had something to to bring last week. Shared something that the Holy Spirit was speaking to you, or that you saw as we were doing that exercise and, and, and visions and seeing what God has for us. People shared testimonies. People shared what the Holy Spirit was saying. That's when the church comes together, when the ecclesia comes together, everybody's supposed to have something. Now, you know, we're not supposed to feel guilty if we're having a bad day or something. Or maybe we just need to receive today or whatever. But in general, we're supposed to come to bring something. You know, when there's that little thing that people say, oh, I, I'm going to leave that church because I just don't get fed. I just don't have any sympathy for that. I just think it's silly. But... The, the sad part is that's what we've made church to be, so that's what they learned, that they're supposed to go to church to get fed instead of coming to church to bring something. And then usually we take home some something that somebody else brought. It's like a potluck dinner in the spirit, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I brought something, I'm sharing what I brought, you brought something, you're sharing, with, and we all take something home. You know, everything gets consumed, but we all take something home, right? And, and that's how it should be uh, in the spirit, that we all come with something. If we're not getting fed, it's probably because we didn't bring anything. <laughs> you know? Sounds a little selfish, I guess. You know, didn't bring anything. <laughs> but, but it's really us. It's, it's really, I didn't bring anything because I didn't really, you know. If that guy up on the front doesn't say something I like, then, then I'm not going to get fed. But that's not, that's not, that's what we've allowed it to become, but that's not really the fullness of what the church is supposed to be. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a preacher. I'm not saying that none of those things are good. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in the fullness of what the church is supposed to be, we're all supposed to be bringing something into it. Yeah, it, it I was raised Catholic until I was 18 or 19, and every single week, the Catholics recite the Apostles' Creed, and in it it says they believe in one Holy Catholic mm -hmm. Apostolic Church. Yeah. They are saying that they believe in one church, one Christian church. Yeah. And Catholic just means universal. Exactly. Yeah. So they have the right idea there that yeah. they are one. Yeah. We're one we're doing and I love to see when the church comes together and does things together. But what I want to focus on is 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 particularly uh, well let, let me let me look at this other scripture too. So the ecclesia is called out of what we call now the marketplace. Because everybody's in the marketplace, right? Like, most people are in the market, you know, we're, we're have some, or, or we've retired from the marketplace, some of us, right? <laughs> but, but still we're in the marketplace, still we go and we eat at restaurants, or we, uh, we go and we, uh, you know, we hang out with different people, we go into the Walmart or the shop, right, or whatever. We are part of the marketplace if we're not actively involved in being the marketplace. Um, and so the church is actually called, it's people that are, that, are, that are saved in the marketplace and then called together to be the church to continue to reach out into the marketplace to shine the light there so people can come into the church. I don't mean into the church building, I just mean into the family. You know, so um, I don't think I can get too far into, into that. Maybe. We'll, we'll save that for another time. Um, but let, let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he calls you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. The point is that he's pulled everyone that's in the ecclesia out of the kingdom of darkness, out of darkness, into his wonderful light. There's another scripture that says, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of your son. That was mixing those up. But he's pulled us out of darkness into his light. And we didn't change locations necessarily. In, in, in the physical. We still live in the same house, probably. We still go to the same job. We still have a lot of the same friends. Sometimes that has to change, because it just doesn't work anymore. 
But he's taken us out of the kingdom, a spiritual kingdom of darkness, and brought us into a spiritual kingdom of light so that we can shine. Now, now I just had this picture when I was when I was thinking about this. Just think about it. You, you, it's like you're in like unlit candles, I guess, or something, or unlit light bulbs or something, and you're just dark. You just, you're not, you know. And then he takes you out of, you know, with all those other unlit lights and stuff, and he, and he brings you and he lights you up. But he doesn't just keep you there. He pretty much gets a few other lit up candles and sticks you back there. <laughs> you know, but that, how many know, uh, even just on Christmas Eve, and you've probably done it at candle lighting services, you, everybody doesn't just go to, you know, somebody doesn't come around with one lighter and just light every individual candle. Usually once, once a couple candles get lit, it's like, oh, hey, you can light off mine. You can light off mine. You know? And we do that, and that's kind of what happens. We, become, we come into this kingdom, and we become an ecclesia, and we're, we're lit up candles that then get are able to light up other candles. And we see that there's something good about it. There's something good about being part of this ecclesia. We can make a difference. And then once, once light starts to infiltrate the darkness of any particular area, maybe it's your workplace, or maybe it's your home, or maybe it's... Maybe it's just the city, you know, that you're a part of. Hopefully it then expands to, you know, more than that. Your, your region. Uh, light is better than darkness. People just got to know that. When, when, it's, when it's real light. Sometimes I think the church has not really, we, we haven't really reflected. The body has looked very different than the head often. You know, I think it was Gandhi that said, you know, I like your Jesus, I just don't like your Christians. You know, <laughs> we have to get an understanding of who we really are and begin to act like who we really are as, as the ecclesia, as Jesus church, that's called. You know, if we look, don't look like Jesus, then something's wrong. We've got, right. you know, yeah. and that's why sometimes the, the church isn't that effective. Not only do we not know we can be effective, but we don't actually look like Jesus sometimes. So the more we're together, the more we're... Um, we're connecting with one another, the more we begin to look like Jesus. And that's and that's what that let let's see is call us out of darkness. Once and you can show now you can show others the goodness of God. And that's that's what we're supposed to do. Then then to show others the goodness of God. A lot of times the church shows others the judgment of God. And that's all we can focus on. You know, um, it's not that there isn't a judgment. It's just that's not how Jesus chose to show himself. You know, that's not how he chose to bring people into his kingdom. He chose the goodness of God to lead us to repentance. The kindness of God to lead us to repentance. And it's just much more effective. Because if you're just doing something, if you're in a relationship with someone, you're just doing what they say because you're afraid of them, what kind of relationship is that? There is a holy fear that we should have of God. There's no question about that. But he wants us to, to obey him. He wants us to do what he's called us to do and, and, and fulfill our purpose because out of love for him and out of love for one another, that's our motivation. That's what the ecclesia is. So the ecclesia is a family with an incredible purpose and miraculous power. And and that's what we're, we're, we're going to focus on the next you know, however long is, okay, we've we got those pictures of, of what God is going to do, uh, uh, even in the next three months, I think, one of the things was last week. And we were seeing planting, we were seeing castles, we were seeing, uh, you know, we were seeing building, we were seeing foundations, we were seeing those kinds of things, we we're seeing us come together, you know, we were seeing things that God wants to do and begin to produce uh, fruit, um, but I want to say something different than fruit. Although fruit is, is an okay word for it. He wants to produce something out of us. He wants, a, he wants offspring. You know, some sort of product. <laughs> you know, um, something that we can say, oh look, this is, this, is, this is our offspring. This is what happened that because of, as a result of us coming together and, and doing what God has called us to do and understanding who we are and, and bringing our gifts together. Fruit comes out of intimacy. As we're intimate, as we're intimate with the Holy Spirit, this is a whole other message. But if we're intimate with the Holy Spirit, we get the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? 
So if you're lacking love, joy, peace, things like that, you know, you just have to more into, you need more intimacy with the Holy Spirit to produce that. But when we're intimate with one another, spiritually intimate with one another as a body, God produces something out of that. Because intimacy produces fruit. That's why he called us together to be one so that he can produce something out of us. So he's saying, this year I'm going to be producing some stuff out of you guys. You know, and that's exciting to me. You know, uh, Marcy got that word, the foundation is, is built. Now we're going to start to see something. You know, and I, I don't know if, I think she may or may not have shared it with, with, on Sunday, but... Um, you know, who really goes to see a foundation? You know, <laughs> nobody. You know, it's it's a it's an extremely important part of the building, and you can't build one without it. But it's not really necessarily attractive, and it's not really much to look at. You know, it's when you start building and start putting the siding on or whatever it is the out in you know, the exterior. You know, and you start seeing the beauty of the building that that it's, it becomes more attractive. So that's what the Holy Spirit was saying to us. Part of what He was saying to us is that, is that He's He's going to you're going to start seeing something out of your coming together. It's not fruitless. Just oh, oh we're going to. You know. I never actually feel that way on Sunday, but but you know sometimes if we don't feel like we have a purpose for coming together, it can get like, oh, do I really need to go? <laughs> Are they really going to miss me? Well, yes, because. You know, if your seat's empty, it's big. It's big emptiness <laughs> in a building this size. <laughs> but okay. So now, Ephes let's look at this. Ephesians two nineteen. I'm almost done here. Uh, so now, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with God's holy people. We are citizens of a kingdom. That's something we have to recognize because we understand citizenship in America. When people come to America, they want to become citizens. You know. It's a little different now, but but generally, you know, if you want to establish yourself in a particular place, you want to become a citizen, so you get all the rights and, and, and things of citizenship. We have become citizens of a kingdom. We are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Um, church isn't a place to go, but it is a building. It's, <laughs> it's not a physical building, it's a spiritual building for the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit. So not only does he dwell in us as individuals, but as we come together, we provide a place for the Holy Spirit to dwell in a in a, in a bigger way, let's say. Right? No, no temple can hold God. You know, even when David wanted to build a temple, the, the, the God said, I didn't ask you to build a temple. You know, you really can't hold me in any way. But he wanted to honor him by building a place where he could inhabit the earth. Right? So he came and he filled the temple with his glory and the Shekinah glory and the smoke and all the stuff filled the temple. And that's so exciting. But you know what? Every day the Shekinah glory can fill your temple. And every time we come together as a church, whether it's also on a Sunday or whether it's in your living room or whether it's in your kitchen or whether you go out to dinner, the Shekinah glory of God can fill the temple because we've come together and we are part of the kingdom. We, are, we become a habitation for God. And it's not just so we can experience a nice tingle or any of that stuff, because that happens. I mean, there's a reality to that. It's so that we can be empowered and equipped. Remember, Les said, you know, uh, we've been we've gone through a lot of training, I think is the word you use, and now it's time for equipping. And equipping is so we can go out. So, so soldiers are equipped so they can go out and do battle, right? Um, if you get a new job, they say, oh, well, okay, you're going to need a computer for this, you're going to need that, you're going to need, uh, you know, whatever. And you get your equipment if you're, you know, you do some kind of mechanical work or you need a toolbox or whatever. So you get this equipment so you can go out and do and, 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 and produce something with your life, right? And that's what, that's what he's doing with us. So I want you to know, we're not, we don't, we're, we're not a church so much as we're an ecclesia. If we can, if we can, and, and an ecclesia is an empowered assembly of people that come together for a purpose to to uh, 
to uh, make policy in the kingdom. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And to affect the environment around us, especially the dark environment around us, we, we bring the light into the dark environment around us. So, so we do things like having a prayer meeting with, with community leaders. See how that goes. See what God does with that. We want them to know that it's not, you know, who wants another meeting? Mm -hmm. You know, just to have another meeting or just to say, oh, we have a whatever, you know. Nobody wants that. But if we can make a difference by coming together and see this community. Hamilton is, is a blessed community. I mean, in all of our county, really, in our region, we're one of the most blessed communities. But, but we have to continue to acknowledge that God blesses us, and we have to continue to pursue after him. Because just like anybody, just like Israelite, Israelites were blessed, and they let it just die. Different revivals come along in the church, and, and wow, it's so great. And it just sort of dies out. You have to continue to sustain that and, and create an environment where, where that blessing can be carried to the next generation. i got to tell you, I expect multiple generations to follow me. And I expect what we do here is going to affect multiple generations for years and years and years to come. And it's supposed to get better and better and better. Because the increase of his kingdom and his peace, there will be no end. So I want to encourage you. You have power, and we together have incredible power that we don't even probably comprehend yet. We're an ecclesia. You know? And Jesus is going to build it. He's going to build something. So don't look around and go, oh, there's not many people here. I, that didn't even bother me anymore. Uh, I was going to talk about micro church, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I'll, I'll say something quickly about it. Yeah. I'll say something quickly about it. So, um, this guy, Lance Wallnow, um, talks about seven mountains, and uh, he's like a big seven mountains guy. The seven mountains are different, particular identifiable areas of culture, say, so government, uh, family, uh, arts and entertainment, um, education, uh, business, religion, I don't know, probably left one out or something, I don't know. But, um, so realizing that there's different areas. It's not that we're just a church and we just need everybody to come into the church and this is the only place we can make an impact. It's that we can make an impact as citizens of the kingdom in the marketplace, in other areas of culture. And that it's okay for a Christian to uh, make an impact in the entertainment industry. That's not just all bad. Because if the light goes in there, it begins to change the darkness into light. Right? Um, it's not how the church is has looked at things for a long time. Uh, so anyway, this guy does this video thing in, at night, at midnight, and I don't watch it at midnight, but he usually posts it the next day. And I saw this little thing that said microchurch. It caught my attention. Um, I listened to it, and I said, that's, that's it. That's us. Not, not because we're small. <laughs> that, 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 that wasn't the point. It was because even if two or three come together in prayer, and we target areas in prayer that God, the Holy Spirit is directing us. It's going to make a difference. Prayer really does change things. It's a shame that the prayer meeting is usually the smallest meeting or gathering of the church. I mean, not just here, but all over. Uh, not always. There are some churches that have huge prayer meetings. And Brooklyn Tabernacle is, you know, built on prayer meetings. You know, yeah. but um, but but. I want to encourage you that when you do come together in prayer, if there's just a few of us, or if you have a prayer meeting at your own home or something, or, um, it doesn't matter if there's a few people or a lot of people. If, you, if you're coming together and you're, and you're connecting with, with the Holy Spirit and targeting certain things, God is going to change some things. So I just want to tell you, we are targeting Glenn Straw right now in prayer. Anybody know who Glenn Straub is? If I haven't told you, I didn't. I, I couldn't remember either. I had read. I had read a um, article a while back about him, but I just forgot his name. Uh, and I just know this is the Holy Spirit. Glenn Straub owns the Revel, uh, the the big, beautiful, closed down uh, casino, right? Um, uh, I won't go into all why. Why it was an interesting story, but I won't go into all. Of it. But so I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you know, start praying for him. Because as much prayer as we can do, I still don't have a billion dollars. That, um, you know, I mean, 
I could start playing the lottery, and that's that's going to be over a billion uh, on Wednesday. So I saw on the paper this morning <laughs> on the news. Um, but I don't have a billion dollars, so I can't go and buy a, a, a place down in Atlantic City and transform it into something that can help transform the, the climate of that city. I can't do that myself. But God can give me, or somebody in the kingdom, influence with a guy like Glenn Straub, who can buy the Revel, and can buy the Showboat, and can buy the Boardwalk Hall, and he does it for a hobby. It's just something he likes to do, enjoys. He enjoys the, the, old, the whole deal of it. Um, I saw, I read an article that he has a broken shoulder. And I started praying. Yeah, right? Yeah. I started praying that people like Stephen and Brian Richards, who are guys that work at the Brigada, who pray for everybody, they, they get words of knowledge pretty much every day at work, you know, and, and don't care who it is, they pray for them, and they see guys healed. One day, Brian just touched a guy, um, and just, just I think he said, you know, I, I, he didn't, he didn't pray a prayer. He just said, hey "Amen" or something like that. Instantly, a spirit of depression and suicide left the guy. Who, his brother had committed suicide, and he was, he was there himself. He was at that point himself. He went to work. Brian just walked by him and just said, you know, "Amen" or something like that. And immediately, just like remember, I mean, this is Bible stuff. Peter, Peter's shadow, yeah, kind of thing. I said, God, bring him in contact. Bring him in contact with this guy. Bring the Maccabeos in contact with this guy, who they actually saw his boat, his yacht called the Triumphant Lady, <laughs> Triumphant Bride. Right? I just think it's all cool. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I, I don't know anything about his religious thought process or affiliation or I don't know if he has any. All I'm saying is that if we target somebody like that in prayer, God can begin to change their heart. Bring somebody, I'm thinking, oh, he has a broken shoulder. Wouldn't it be cool if somebody from the kingdom was got a word of knowledge and said, hey, you know, didn't even know who he was, you know, probably sitting at a, at a restaurant or something and say, hey, um, this might sound weird, but do you have a problem with your shoulder? Can I pray for you? And God heal him and get his attention? You know what I mean? So that's the kind of thing, targeted prayer. So I'm praying, God, capture this guy's heart. Bring somebody into his life that can heal his shoulder or somehow get his attention for the kingdom and realize that he can really make it. His hobby could make all the difference in the world. You know? Um, that's the kind of thing. We can make a difference. We need to transform. We're, we're here, like the Garden of Eden. And we have this nice little thing here. But God wants us to take it beyond where we are into the, the darkness of the world. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the ecclesia. So we don't have to be afraid of going into dark places and bringing the kingdom. The kingdom of love, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, the kingdom, you know, fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, that, that kind of kingdom. We don't have to be afraid of bringing that into darkness. Now, I'm not saying that there's never persecution. I'm not saying that it's always easy. I'm not saying any of that, because that, that, that comes too. But we do have the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail when we come against them. You know, in any war, there are casualties of war. But the cool thing is we have a personal promise that no matter whether we're a casualty of war, we still have a home in heaven. <laughs> you know what I mean? We still have, we, you know, so it's like we always win. But if we just sit and wait for something to happen, it won't. He's, he's, he's called us together for a purpose to infiltrate and to, and, and to influence the, our culture around us. And it doesn't matter if there's just a few of us to do. Yeah. When you when you when you present it that way, you change like a church into the ecclesia. There's purpose in getting together. Yeah. You know, the other way we come, we praise God, we love meeting with Him. It's so awesome. But looking at the, the real way, it's there's purpose. There's real purpose. There's something purpose. to get done. Yeah. There's something to get accomplished. 
Einstein, like his book, says that there's, he gives an, um, what do they call that, where he says when you pray, when you mm -hmm. pray it's supposed to be pray, uh, praise, request, assess, and yield. When we get together in that prayer, yeah. he said there should always be a purpose, and it's prayer, yeah. request, assess, and yield. Yeah. And remember that because then it gives a purpose to what we're doing. Yeah. And so what a prayer warrior he is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's a bigger true. purpose than just, uh, you know, like, you know, we, we do, we come and help me with this, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's, yeah. And it's, that can happen. I mean, we'll get into other stuff, you know, the right. whole the gifts God gave to the church so, so that we can yeah. become what we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But um, just the basic idea that, that, that we are in Ecclesia. We're, yeah. we're not just, it's not just a thing to do on Sunday. That we should do, or that's yeah. fun, or you that we enjoy. It's there's much bigger purpose. Because for us. you right away connected that with the pizza couple. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I mean, it exactly. Wasn't like, oh, that and they gave nice his keys to the kingdom. That's a whole that. other thing. He's like, no, that. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to make this ecclesia, and where am I going to put it? I'm not going to put it on a nice little mountaintop away from everything. I'm going to put it at the gate of hell, <laughs> and the gates of hell aren't going to be able to do anything about it. That's awesome. <laughs> I think it's great. We had um, one of my, on my day off, the girls told me the next day when I came back to work, a medium came in and got her hair done. Mm -hmm. So my one employee, who I won't say, was like trying to like, you know, like, she's kind of like a little enamored with it. And yeah. They all know how like I feel. Like we do with profits. Hey, give me a word. They all know how I feel about it. <laughs> so my, my, my was like, joy. Beverly, we were like, Beverly, would you have an heart attack? <laughs> You're engaging. But I was like, Totally not, because mm -hmm. I got news for her. She was getting nothing yeah. in my building. Yeah. Right? So I was like, no. Yeah. No. Exactly. So I think they were all like stunned. I was like, yeah. It's not getting anything, anything to the Lord. Yeah. When the demoniac came to Jesus, I almost, I, I heard T.D. Jake say this, and I thought this was really interesting. Who told the demoniac that Jesus was coming? Because Jesus was like, we're going to go over there. Mm -hmm. Like, last minute, we're going to go over there. He goes over there, and he really, his vision, his version of it was that the demons inside of him said, he's coming. Yeah. He's coming. Jesus is coming. God's coming. So I got to tell the girls that I'm like, God's coming. So demons have a way of knowing who uh, God is. Yeah. They know who oh, he is. Oh, yeah. So yeah. that was black and white. And I was just like, I said, I, you know, she told me she's welcome to be a client of ours. I can really care less. But honestly, like, as far as her, like, getting anything from mm -hmm. my building, mm -hmm. I was like, she's not going to get anything from me. Yeah. So this is just he said some Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. my building. Yeah. No. No. So. And she's just a pawn in the whole. She's just a pawn. That's what I'm saying. Know, she just needs to be recognized. And I think the girls never looked at it. And probably like, would be very effective. Demons actually knowing yes. God. Yes. Like, they knew God was. They knew yeah. Jesus was. They were like, oh, he's coming. Yeah. Okay, let's jump in the pigs and the whole pig story. And yeah. Look at this. I mean, I hate them. They kill the pigs. Yeah, but get out of town. Well, the fortune teller. They followed Peter and, uh, and Paul and Silas oh, around. Money. Yeah, right. away the money. She was saying, these are men of God. These are men of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they recognized there was a spirit in her that needed to come out of her for her to be able to fulfill her real purpose. I got to tell them about yeah. the legions. That's awesome. Yeah. Like cool. Legions and their life. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. we're in a story now, guys. <laughs> Come on, story time. Everybody has a story. Everybody's good. Say, that's good. That's so good. good. That's so she's good. not getting anything from my building. Yeah. I don't know what you mean. Uh, 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 yeah. Praise God. Yeah. I was just thinking of it. Just thinking of all I know. And one of the major things in all of this, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to show you was, and it's in the um, 15, 10, so it says that God is angels are happy that one person returns to God and changes the way he thinks about us. Mm -hmm. And like, to me, that was just like, that's the whole reason for all of this. Mm -hmm. so all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and stuff like that. Like, oh, yeah. And keep that in mind. Like, it's like that one thing. Yeah, when the when, when the light shines in the darkness, it attracts. It will attract people, you know, to the kingdom. But yeah. That's hard. Like he wants that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. And like that's the most important thing out of whether it's demonic or anything. It's like God's heart wanted that person. Yeah. Right. So happy. Yeah. You know, and like. Well, that was the whole gist of the story. Was when the demoniac heard the demons talking, he 
drug himself to see God. Like yeah. he, he was like, oh, I can get out of this thing now. I, yeah. I can get out of this. So he, you know, got to Jesus and then Jesus freed him. So yeah. that was really the whole story of the story. But the demons actually probably did let him know because people were scared of him. They never yeah. went near him. And then he ended up being an evangelist he in, in the ten go. cities of that area yeah. and, and became an evangelist to tell other people you can be free too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, this is cool. So good. Yeah. I shared something with someone this week that was battling or something. And I read where it said, uh, don't fight God that God already has. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I said, it doesn't mean that you want to stick down to that thing. Mm -hmm. Because that'll be wonderful for you, but you still have. Stand on that yeah. You still have to stand on that victory. Yeah. Because they were felt that they were bad. You stand on that victory. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. So good. Right. So Father, thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you that you, Jesus, that you told us that you would build your ecclesia, and uh, there would be nothing that the hell could do about it. Mm -hmm. That we could, that, that, we, that when we come against the gates of hell, uh, that they have to fall, and that when we push back the darkness, we reveal the lives of people who have been affected by the darkness, and we're able to pick them up, mm -hmm. and we're able to dust them off, mm -hmm. and we're able to bring them into the kingdom of light. Lord God, we know that your angels rejoice over them. God, we're so thankful. Uh, we're thankful for this person that was that came into Solana Vante, God. We just bless her, God. And we call her out of darkness into your light in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. We call Glenn Straub into your kingdom, God. Uh, and others that are that are uh, able to be movers and shapers financially uh, in our region, God, uh, in our community, God. Uh. Father, we thank you for this month that's going to have such an impact on this region through prayer and through uh, your, your, your people, the citizens of your kingdom, having a voice uh, in the marketplace, God. Uh. And uh, Father, we thank you that uh, that when we come together, we do have a purpose. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we continue to reveal that purpose, God. We bless the, the, the fruit and the building that's going to happen uh, this year uh, for, for Living Springs, God. And Father, we ask you to give us eyes to see where you want to plant, uh, where you want to build, where these foundations are, God, that you showed us last week, God. And, um, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for one another. And I ask you, Lord, that we would be a blessing this week as we go. Uh, that, we would, that we would be aware of what you're up to, God, uh, so that we can release your kingdom.